So, in fact, uh, the focus of this lecture is, is going to be how to get uh, classical physics out of um, quantum scattering amplitudes. And I'm going to start with a bit of uh, background uh, before we really launch uh, into the subject. And of course, the, the ultimate goal here is indeed to get um, gravitational wave physics uh, out of it. So 2015 was uh, what we might call a first uh, shaking from uh, LIGO by analogy with uh, first light at uh, observatories. And uh, for those of you who don't know, LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometric uh, Gravitational Observatory. And uh, you know that it sees incredibly small distortions in the gravitational uh, metric. And uh, we've had uh, it's seen dozens of events. In fact, I think the count uh, is probably over 100 now. I didn't uh, go to count uh, precisely uh, since then. And um, I don't know about uh, you and, and your interests. Some of them may still be forming. But I'm originally a high energy physicist, and I've been working in the uh, deepest of quantum regimes and quantum chromodynamics for the LHC. And so you might wonder, why am I here giving a series of lectures about such feeble and uh, deeply classical phenomena. So I'd like to begin a little bit with uh, a background, an introduction uh, explaining this a little bit, and also giving some uh, context uh, to the subject that I will talk about. And I'm going to do that by uh, first describing a few things I'm not going to talk about and I'm not going to describe. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that uh, I myself am a bit of a beginner in this subject, I've been working on it for what, two, two, three years now. And uh, it's a subject which has a history that stretches back, um, I wouldn't say all the way to the uh, 1918, uh, 1915 papers of, of Einstein, but uh, it goes a good fraction of that way back. Uh, the first suggestions I think of uh, in spiraling uh, binaries uh, go back to the early 60s and Freeman Dyson. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of different approaches, a lot of traditional approaches, and some of those may suit your, your approach to physics and uh, better than what I'm going to talk about. So it's good to, to have uh, a little bit of sense of, of all the other approaches to the problem. And uh, if some of those approaches do fit your style of working, style of thinking better, then I hope that the perspective that I can offer in this different uh, approach is um, will be uh, useful uh, as well. So back to the question of, of high energy physics. Well, the universe, as uh, many of you probably know, is a very violent place. And I wanted to give a few uh, examples of that. So imagine that we have a small black hole, um, let's say O3 uh, solar masses, and uh, that would make it about uh, 8.9 kilometers in size. So it's about the size of, uh, of Paris, which uh, in fact is uh, very close to home right now, since that's where I'm sitting. And imagine it eating the Earth. So this um, would release about um, 3.2 times uh, 10 to the 40th joules. OK, well, that sounds like a big number, but it's good to compare that to the solar luminosity. So that, uh, if you Google it, which is, I think, what I did, you find that it's about uh, 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts. So over its lifetime, that uh, 
the sun will release about uh, 10 to the 44 uh, joules. So this is already a very noticeable fraction, well, it's at least a perceptible fraction of the lifetime luminosity of the sun. Let's move on. Uh, supernova would uh, release about uh, 10 to the 46th joules in, in a few seconds. And most of that is in neutrinos, but I, if I recall correctly, it's about 1% uh, of that is in, uh, in light. And uh, so it's peak visible luminosity, and that stretches over a little bit more than a, a few seconds, but it's uh, peak visible luminosity is about uh, five times uh, 10 to the 36 watts. And that's uh, about the same as the luminosity of a galaxy. Um, and uh, that of course is how one can uh, see uh, supernovae um, very far, uh, very far away. So if we move up another uh, scale, then the uh, luminosity of the uh, local supercluster is about uh, 10 to the 42 watts, so another few orders of magnitude uh, up. And uh, now if we compare that with the peak luminosity of a uh, 30 solar mass uh, black hole merger, pair of 30 solar uh, black, 30 uh, solar mass uh, black holes, then we find that that's about um, four times 10 to the 49th uh, watts. That's the peak luminosity. And in fact, that's more than the uh, luminosity of the visible universe. So these are extremely violent events. And uh, I think from my point of view, oops, visible universe, not university. University I think is probably invisible at this point. Um, and uh, so from a high energy physicist point of view, uh, these energies are, are indeed uh, enormous. And uh, the thing that was different before 2015, before LIGO's uh, first shaking, first uh, gravitational light, is that uh, this violence used to be invisible. And we can now uh, see it. And it's still, of course, very hard uh, to, to do that. And it was invisible because it's all in gravitational uh, radiation. And it's very hard to see gravitational radiation in spite of the uh, enormous amount of, uh, of energy involved. It's hard to do that because it's very weakly coupled. So I'm not I'm very far from an observer or experimenter, so I'm just going to uh, flash the schematic of uh, LIGO, which I uh, stole from a talk by uh, Aaron Zimmerman. And uh, so there are two arms. These are, there are two detectors in LIGO itself, one sitting in uh, Hanford, Washington, and the other in Livingston, uh, Louisiana. And you bounce the uh, light off these along a set of mirrors and a very high vacuum tube along the two arms, which are uh, perpendicular to each other. And there's a third uh, detector, which is basically part of the same uh, collaboration now, Virgo, which is sitting outside uh, Pisa, Italy, it's slightly smaller. And uh, by looking at the interference fringes after the light bouncing back and forth many, many times, you can hope to see displacements that are in fact uh, much smaller than the size of the, uh, the proton. So they will be joined by other 
uh, observatories uh, in coming years. There's uh, a detector which is in the Kamioka tunnel in Japan, which is in the process of uh, commissioning. I don't know exactly where that stands since I don't uh, track them day to day or even month to month. And then there are uh, detectors that are being built in, in India. And uh, of course, the, the advantage, the, there's a big jump in going from two to three detectors because that allows you to localize the source of uh, the gravitational uh, radiation event. And as you add more detectors, then you're able to get uh, more and more precise information, uh, both about the characteristics of the event and about its uh, localization. So this is, uh, in some sense, the start of what I think will be a very exciting uh, field, subfield of, of uh, physics and uh, astronomy over the course of, uh, of your careers, those of you who, who stay in uh, scientific research. And uh, there are gonna be many future uh, gravitational wave uh, observatories. And uh, these, uh, of course, take uh, time to, to build and, and commission. So these are long scale uh, projects, just as in uh, particle physics for accelerators, except that I think that uh, at the moment, the prospects of at least some of these uh, going forward are much better than those for uh, future colliders. So of course, they're going to be a next generation uh, terrestrial observatories. And uh, the two ones that are, let's say, in serious planning are the, uh, the Einstein telescope in, uh, in Europe and uh, the so-called Cosmic Explorer in the uh, US. And uh, beyond that, they're going to be uh, space-based uh, observatories. So one of them is, is kind of, you might say, a solar system scale. Maybe this. And uh, that is, of course, uh, the so-called uh, laser interferometric uh, space antenna or LISA. And uh, people are talking about that as sort of being, starting to, to actually collect data in about uh, 2035. So that's a little bit along a horizon for me, but for some of you, it uh, may well be perfect. And there's a lot of physics that can do, but one of the uh, new things it will open uh, open our eyes to is that of uh, supermassive black hole mergers. These are black holes that are millions or, or in some cases even billions of uh, solar masses that sit at the centers of, of galaxies. There are also uh, space-based uh, observatories, uh, you might call them that, uh, that are, are really galactic uh, in scale and no uh, this doesn't uh, require us to build Dyson spheres or become a Kardashian level two or level three uh, civilization. Uh, this is the International uh, Pulsar Timing Array. And uh, these are based on long-term uh, observations of, uh, of neutron stars. And uh, the using the neutron stars themselves, whose timing uh, you can measure uh, if they're processing extremely accurately. And as gravitational waves go by, it will distort that. And uh, this you can use, of course, to measure, again, uh, typically uh, black hole, uh, supermassive black hole uh, events. And finally, another thing that I think is, is is uh, worth keeping an eye on because it would be almost uh, lab scale um, detectors are ideas based on uh, on the cold atom interferometry. At the moment, this is really uh, just at the idea stage, but I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how that develops uh, over time. 
so uh, that's that's sort of what the instruments uh, will look like uh, going uh, going forward. And um, the the next question one might ask are what are the science goals? And uh, so one of the thing is is to of course continue and uh, understand better the discovery that was already made very early on by uh, LIGO. And uh, that's, you know, what kinds of, of heavy uh, compact uh, objects uh, do we have? So, um, and uh, in fact, uh, we've already seen uh, the existence uh, unsuspected, previously unsuspected uh, uh, existence of uh, of ten tens of uh, solar masses masses uh, black holes, and so it'll be interesting to understand more about their distribution, uh, their origin, uh, what they can tell us about uh, the early universe, and of course. Uh, this is still awaiting uh, extension into uh, neutron stars to um, understand where the boundary between neutron stars and, um, and black holes is. That's still an unsettled uh, question. And that depends a little bit on uh, the equation of state for neutron stars. And that's something uh, which we'll have, uh, which has an impact on the pattern of, of radiation and uh, which the theoretical effort is still, uh, the theorists are still not able to do the appropriate uh, calculations. And that's where uh, those of you who jump into this uh, subject will have the opportunity to, to play a role. And that might sound uh, like an esoteric problem, uh, even if it's a long standing one many different uh, candidate equations of state for the interior of neutron stars. But uh, it will be interesting uh, for those of you who, of course, uh, have uh, that astrophysical interest, interesting for those who are kind of fans of quark matter and whether that has any, anything to, to contribute. But it's, uh, there's also a little bit uh, more down to earth uh, aspect, which is the contribution of neutron star mergers to uh, transferic uh, or very heavy element production. So all the transferic elements that you actually see on Earth, there's some fraction of those that may well have been uh, produced in neutron star mergers. And it would be very interesting to know what fraction that is, and that depends on the equation of state. And that is something which these um, observations uh, with additional theoretical work that still remains to be done uh, have a chance of, uh, of revealing. And there are also more speculative uh, ideas that neutron stars can be used to uh, measure the, the yet another measurement of the Hubble constant. I'm not going to say any more about that. One can uh, imagine uh, in the spirit of astroparticle physics uh, going back to get uh, more limits on uh, exotic uh, compact objects, uh, boson stars, axion, compact axion objects, and um, that, uh, that of course is, is always uh, nice. There are, um, will be opportunities to do precision uh, strong field uh, tests of, uh, of uh, Einstein's uh, theory and see if there are any uh, corrections. And uh, again, that uh, the, the uh, I, I'm always a strong, I've always been a strong believer in uh, null experiments, even if you don't expect to see anything, knowing how well you actually know that is, uh, has proven very valuable over the years in particle physics. And I would expect that uh, 
it would be valuable in this uh, context too. And somewhat more uh, speculatively, um, depending on your models for what black holes really look like at the uh, quantum level. Uh, so we, we may in the LISA era get some insight into uh, quantum gravity, uh, in particular if some of these uh, mature type uh, fuzzball models of black holes are, uh, are actually true. And uh, there's actually structure at the uh, scale, a substantial fraction of the horizon scale, then uh, studying the uh, coalescence of supermassive black holes may teach us uh, something about that. So that's, that's kind of the physics and, uh, and astrophysics that uh, we can look forward to in, uh, in coming uh, decades. And uh, because it's such a new domain, as, as we've already seen with LIGO, I think it's almost inevitable that, that there will be surprises and uh, exciting things will be, will be forthcoming. Um, so, can I, can yes. I ask you something? Um, so you said that um, there was this, um, we thought that um, the existence of tens of solar masses of black holes. So why was this unexpected? and? Was it cleared up theoretically then, when if, if, if it was un unexpected in the first place? Um, so I, I'm not enough versed in the astrophysics literature to say uh, why exactly it was unexpected, uh, but it was a surprise uh, to people. Uh, there was certainly no way that the LIGO people were expecting to see many more black hole mergers than neutron star mergers. <clears throat> in fact, at a conference I'm attending in parallel with the school, one of the LIGO people admitted uh, that they almost did optimizations that would have prevented them from seeing black hole mergers because they figured, well, it can't really be important. Uh, so I can't really answer that question, uh, but it, it definitely was the sentiment uh, in the community, there was no obvious formation mechanism for these uh, heavy uh, black holes. In fact, it's it's more puzzling than just heavy black holes. It's heavy black hole binaries because um, the you know, these events are very violent, but they take a long time to arrive. Gravitational radiation causes orbits to decay very slowly, so they can't have started uh, too far off. So. It's, uh, it's both the formation mechanism of the black holes themselves and uh, the formation mechanism of the binary systems of, of black holes that is, uh, I think, still an outstanding puzzle. And for those who are interested in astrophysics, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting question to, to ask what the formation mechanism, could there be uh, some connection to primordial uh, black holes? Uh, these are all interesting questions, and and uh, they're questions which I unfortunately cannot uh, illuminate uh, anymore. Thank you. So, um, back to our uh, our LIGO uh, schematics. So again, we're as I was saying, you're trying to measure ultimately uh, displacements here that are about uh, ten thousand times. Uh, smaller than the size of the uh, the proton, and uh, so what that means is that uh, you have, of course, uh, extreme uh, sensitivity to noise, and um, you have to worry about the stability of the uh, laser. And uh, you have to worry about the quality of the mirror. And these are all aspects which um, I think the collaboration uh, has gone so far beyond what the experts thought was possible, uh, let's say 25 years ago when the, uh, the project uh, started. That it's really a, an incredible uh, feat of, of uh, engineering, really frontier engineering. And uh, it also features the world's uh, third uh, largest uh, vacuum chamber. 
So that is a technology which uh, was well understood from, from uh, uh, particle physics uh, colliders, but it's, um, it's still a, a non-trivial uh, thing to, to manage. And um, of course, you're going to correlate uh, different uh, detectors. So you can, uh, at least initially, you could start with two, now you'll have three. And uh, that, and in the future, there will be uh, four and, uh, and perhaps uh, five. And so that, of course, allows you to eliminate uh, spurious uh, signals. And it also gives you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, directional uh, information about the, uh, where the signal uh, originated. And uh, that's something where you need at least three. And uh, you, the more, uh, the better, given the uncertainties in the, in the data that in sources of, of uh, errors. So one of the things you have to confront is that the noise level is, uh, is very high. And um, it's, uh, I would say it's, you put it about uh, 400 times larger than the signal that uh, you're ultimately trying to, uh, trying to find. So we can look at that. And here I've, I've uh, taken uh, a set of illustrations uh, from uh, a paper uh, about three years ago, which discussed uh, this. And uh, you'll notice that there's uh, the strain data on the left uh, most uh, plot. And uh, you do some filtering, and then ultimately you uh, look at the actual signal. But if you look at the fine print here, you'll see that the scale uh, of, the, of the leftmost plot is, is three orders of magnitude bigger than the signal you're finally extracting in the right-hand uh, plot. That means that on the scale of the leftmost plot, uh, the signal is actually essentially a flat line. So, and it's, it's simply not enough to do correlations of, uh, of different detectors to, to be able to remove that. And um, that's in fact where, why theorists have a role to play and uh, where the, uh, where us theorists come into the picture. So the, the idea is that you have to know what it is you're looking for. You have to know the shape in this uh, rightmost plot. And uh, you're going to pass that shape over the, uh, the signal. And you're go going to try to see if you can find any matches uh, to that shape in the, in the signal. And then, of course, you're going to insist on the correlation. And you're going to do filtering. And you're going to do everything you can initially to reduce the noise uh, in each of the detectors. And of course, it's not a, sig it's not a single uh, shape of the signal that uh, you're going to be uh, looking for because the shape of the signal will depend on the masses, it will depend on the spins, it will depend on the orientation and uh, the relative signals in the two detectors will also depend on the direction and the, the polarization of the uh, gravitational wave. So you actually have to construct a, a forest, I would say, of these uh, templates. And um, your ability to, to detect the signal is dependent on the quality of these templates. And so you need to be able to push that uh, quality um, as high uh, as possible, as close as possible to, uh, in some sense, the exact answer that would be given by, uh, by general uh, relativity. And of course, that's, that's going to be dominated the, the, is where the signal gets strong, and that's the region where it's very hard to do the uh, calculations. And uh, so if we, if we look uh, a little bit more 
uh, in detail. So our basic uh, setup is we have uh, two uh, in spiraling, let's say uh, black holes, they're uh, rotating around each other and uh, they're going to produce uh, that signal that looks something like that. I'm going to, whoops, going to uh, draw a given artist's uh, impression of it and then we'll, so there's really uh, three phases that we have to look at. And uh, for those of you who are uh, disappointed in my drawing skills, uh, I've actually stolen another uh, plot, which is from a uh, computer drawn uh, illustration. So we have in some sense, three different uh, domains that we need to be thinking about. There's the in spiral phase, which takes a very long time, but has a very low uh, signal amplitude. This is where uh, one can do weak field uh, perturbation theory. There's the actual merger uh, corresponding, uh, let's say, to when the um, two black holes, if we're thinking about two black holes, where they're uh, within a fraction of uh, their radius within a kind of a Schwarzschild radius of each other, and then they actually uh, merge together. And finally, the resulting object, in the case of two black holes, it's again a black hole. It's kind of ringing like a bell, and uh, that's something where you can solve the normal mode expansion around a black hole solution and compute that uh, exponential ring down. Uh, that's an interesting uh, topic in itself, but not one I'm going to uh, mention any further. The merger part is, uh, is done uh, with numerical relativity and uh, even with advances about uh, 25 years ago that made it possible to do that at all, uh, to get, uh, let's say of order 100 uh, cycles is something that can still take uh, literally months of uh, supercomputer time. So it's something where you still need, there would still be room for advances in strong field and where you certainly uh, cannot rely on that for a, a complete picture, uh, including the in spiral phase. So um, in, the, in the weak field uh, perturbative um, uh, domain in the in spiral uh, phase, then uh, of course one does uh, weak field uh, perturbation theory. This is uh, something that's already getting uh, closer uh, to the expertise of, of uh, most, uh, most field theorists. And uh, traditionally, uh, this is done in uh, something called the uh, post-Newtonian or, or PN. Uh, approximation. So you're expanding in uh, powers of the uh, relative velocity V. And uh, the other kind of expansion that uh, is coming back into, uh, let's say, the limelight is that which is more uh, conventional for, uh, for field theorists, namely just an expansion in the coupling uh, in powers of, uh, of Newton's uh, constant uh, G, or if you like, uh, in the powers of, of kappa, which is the square root of G up to uh, factors of, of pi. Now, those of you who actually delve further into the uh, subject will learn that uh, in the general relativity community, this very ordinary expansion, perturbative expansion in powers of G is known as uh, the post-Minkowskian expansion, which is a term that uh, you should recognize but never use uh, on your own because it is both uh, confusing and unnecessary. As you can imagine, the distinguishing between PN and PM especially when it's spoken with a strong French accent is, uh, is difficult. And in fact, it doesn't uh, enlighten anything. So um, 
this is something that uh, you should recognize, but you should not use. So um, the, uh, the traditional approach is in fact to take the, uh, you just solve the GR equations of motion. And uh, that uh, I can just write them down. This is in fact, uh, pretty much what directly with uh, some very, very uh, clever and insightful, oops, um, insightful uh, numerical techniques and uh, gauge fixing techniques and uh, is done in numerical relativity. So this is what uh, you do simply in classical perturbation theory, which is a subject that isn't really taught much uh, anymore. And uh, people usually learn it when they have to teach uh, electrodynamics, but... Um, so most of what we know, in fact, almost everything we know about templates and about gravitational waves, and for that matter, a lot of other things about general relativity comes from uh, many decades of, uh, of work in this direction. And so there's a huge literature. And uh, this is the first uh, topic that I'm not going to say more about. Now, it's, uh, it's usually uh, phrased in a Hamiltonian uh, form. And uh, that I suppose is uh, very appropriate uh, for the school and uh, also for those of you who are uh, actually sitting in, uh, in Dublin. So if one focuses on the two body problem, then uh, you might write uh, an expansion that of course starts with the Newtonian term. It's an expansion about the Newtonian limit if one is doing the post-Newtonian uh, approximation. And uh, there's uh, higher orders in uh, that approximation. Um, and incidentally, uh, when you look at the literature, uh, each order in the post-Newtonian refers to powers of V squared, but there are terms that can be odd order in V. And so those will be uh, half integer order. So you might find the 2.5 PN and uh, that is, uh, is just part of the uh, language. So here one might write out uh, the uh, Hamiltonian. There's an expansion, of course, of the uh, uh, kinetic energies. Uh, and uh, again, one can write additional terms. And then there's a uh, post-Newtonian uh, potential depending uh, on the radius and also on the uh, momenta. And uh, again, that thing starts, that potential starts with the uh, Newtonian term and uh, has various uh, general relativistic uh, corrections. So in the, uh, in the in-spiral problem, uh, at least in the weak field uh, regime. So long before merger, then if we go back to the, uh, so we have uh, the size of our object, which I'll call little r, and then there's the separation, uh, which I'll call big R. And finally, there's the emitted uh, radiation, which has some characteristic wavelength, uh, lambda. Then in that uh, weak field regime, one is going to find that there's a separation of scales. And so that hierarchy of scales is of course uh, the natural place in quantum field theory, if you're doing quantum field theory, uh, to uh, deploy an effective field theory where you integrate out the short distance modes and uh, you trade them off for higher dimension operators. 
And uh, you can do that in this context as well, in the context of, of classical uh, GR. And that was first done by uh, uh, Goldberger and, uh, and Rothstein. And uh, about uh, 15 years ago, if I remember correctly. And that has led to uh, a small community uh, which has also played uh, an important role in connecting uh, some of the uh, scattering amplitudes uh, advances uh, that have emerged recently. And uh, that's a very interesting subject, but again, it's the second topic, which I'm not going to say uh, more about, but something you should be aware of. So one can uh, organize, uh, in fact, one can resum the, the uh, velocity dependence to organize the uh, expansion of the potential um, into a momentum and, uh, and uh, distance hybrid, you can expand it, uh, instead of expanding in powers of V, uh, you can expand it in or an ordinary perturbative expansion uh, in powers of G, and uh, then you're going to get uh, something that has uh, this form. So there's powers of G and then there's coefficients, which are uh, functions of the, uh, of the momenta. And uh, so now one can do essentially two different uh, computations. Uh, the first computation is to compute uh, scattering uh, amplitudes from this uh, potential from an effective field theory that's uh, built using uh, this potential and the unknown coefficients. And then you can compute those same scattering amplitudes by taking the uh, classical limit of a quantum field theory. And uh, that, so th this is, uh, is a way of bridging a gap that um, is of course uh, present when you're talking about scattering amplitudes, you're talking about physics that's above the, uh, the, that's unbound, that uh, where things come in from infinity and go out to infinity. But the, the situation you're interested in, of course, is an inspiraling, it's a bound state and ultimately ending in a, in a very uh, inelastic uh, end, end point. So this is a way of bridging that gap. You do a calculation uh, where you know how to do things, scattering amplitudes uh, on an unbound situation, and then you compute a potential and then you apply that potential uh, to the bound state problem. And that's in fact how uh, Tzvi Bern and uh, his uh, collaborators, I should probably be fairer and list only the younger collaborators rather than the first and senior author, but um, it, would take, uh, it would take a little bit more time. Uh, I do encourage you to look up the paper. So uh, this is how in fact they did the G cubed computation, which uh, was the first uh, result beyond what had then been known from a classical GR uh, in, this, uh, in this business. So this, is, uh, this has some overlap with uh, the rest of what we're going to be talking about, but uh, the precise uh, details of, of this approach and the matching and the EFT, again, are things that uh, I'm not uh, going to not going to discuss. So I've now spent uh, actually quite a bit more time given the slowness of, of writing on this instrument uh, than I'd expected telling you what I'm not going to, to say. So what am I going to say? So the already from this discussion of the matching, there's a little bit of a, of a disconnect. Um, and you might wonder why is it that I'm even uh, talking about uh, quantum uh, scattering. 
amplitudes. So again, we're interested, this is an unbound, uh, very short distance uh, quantum mechanical uh, problem. And at the end of the day, we want a bound state uh, classical uh, result. So there's one aspect I think that uh, is kind of built into the DNA of the scattering amplitudes community. And that uh, you might say is, uh, is, is, a, is the philosophy that uh, you only calculate uh, what's needed uh, for what's needed for physical, oops. Uh, what's needed for uh, physical quantities. And you look for uh, structures, you try to organize that calculation and look for structures that uh, can serve as uh, building blocks for more complicated calculations. And that's been a very successful approach over uh, several decades in the quantum scattering uh, amplitudes community, but that, that's really a very thin uh, motivation. I think it will uh, play a helpful role going forward. Uh, the real promise is that of the, uh, of the double copy and uh, of uh, simplifying uh, calculations uh, in, in uh, GR uh, beyond what you can imagine uh, from any sort of Lagrangian or uh, Hamiltonian based uh, calculation. So, and I, I just want to illustrate that by um, showing a couple of simple examples. So if you look at the, at the Feynman rules uh, for, uh, for GR, then, um, First of all, there's, uh, there's an infinite number of vertices. And um, the complexity of, uh, of each vertex, um, even in an optimal uh, gauge choice, we have uh, of order a hundred uh, terms in the three-point vertex, and it gets worse as you go to higher point uh, vertices. And this, of course, it's not exactly doing Feynman rules when you're doing classical physics. There, there are things that are maybe a little bit uh, more cumbersome or things that are a little bit uh, easier, but it gives you an idea of the complexity. And uh, the Feynman rules for Yang Mills in comparison are much, much simpler. And of course, in the scattering amplitudes community, we've gone well beyond uh, the Feynman rules for uh, we've gone well beyond those Feynman rules to have uh, techniques. Uh, things like uh, recursion relations and unitarity uh, and application of symmetry that uh, make the calculations much simpler and therefore uh, one can go much further in perturbation theory or in the complexity. So, and yet uh, there's a very uh, deep uh, relation between the results in GR and uh, the results in, in Yang Mills. And uh, this is usually characterized uh, by the kind of uh, form that says that uh, gravitational amplitudes are, are in some sense the same thing as the square of, uh, of Yang Mills amplitudes. And the square should be understood uh, generally as, um, 
as a convolution, a discrete uh, convolution. But in the very simplest case, if we look at the three-point amplitudes, then, and we uh, strip them of, uh, of color factors and, uh, and couplings, then this uh, relation is in fact uh, exact. So if we look at the um, formula for the uh, three-point amplitudes written in a modern uh, spinner helicity form, can I have a quick survey of the audience as to who has seen this formula before and who has not? Can someone, uh, one of the organizers maybe count hands or do a quick survey? How many people have seen this before and how many people is this uh, completely novel? This will be important for the second part of, of I assume everyone who's raising their hand has seen this before and- Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. So it's, okay. 14 raised hands so far, 15. And, and that's 14 out of? Uh, it's 14 out of 39, but I, I know there are, oh, it's more now, um, but also some of the co-hosts as well are counted in that. And I know that they're familiar with spinalicity. Okay, so, so we're, we're looking about at about, two, about yeah. two thirds of the students. Or two thirds, yeah. Very good. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, I will make uh, an effort to do a little bit of a lightning review in the second half of Friday's uh, lecture. Um, okay, um, yeah, we, we just reached the, around the 50 minute mark, so. Yes, um, I would like to just, uh, I, I am of course running way behind the pace that I uh, was expecting, but I'd like to uh, just uh, come to the conclusion of, of this uh, relation, and then we will start with the uh, the actual uh, bulk of the technical material in the second half. Sure. So um, one can write down the, and I won't be uh, necessarily careful about this, but I'll try to uh, generally use A for either Yang Mills or generic amplitudes and reserve M uh, specifically when I'm talking about uh, gravity. So of course, the in the gravitational case, um, so again, this is the three point uh, amplitude for obviously three uh, gluons. It's been stripped of the, uh, the Lie algebra factor, the FABC, and two of them have uh, minus helicity, one of them has plus helicity. In the gravitational case, obviously, it's uh, minus minus, it's the, these are helicity plus and minus two. So two minus, two minus, and one graviton of two plus. So this thing is in fact exactly the square. Here there's no uh, figurativeness about it. And um, in a sense, uh, this, these amplitudes themselves are sufficient to uh, reconstruct every possible uh, scattering amplitude. So even if the formula does not hold literally, it's embedded in the very uh, simplest pieces. And uh, just to give an example, then the, uh, the four-point scattering amplitude is a kind of, of discrete uh, convolution. And so again, in terms of, of a pair of uh, Yang Mills amplitudes, here I need to put in the uh, labels, the external uh, particle labels. So it's essentially a discrete convolution. In the case of the five point, there'd be a sum over uh, a few terms. But the key idea here is that if you know the Yang Mills amplitudes, and this, this discussion here is tree level, but there's a lot of information you can get about uh, loop level as well. And because of that hierarchy of complexity that I uh, outlined on the previous uh, board. If one can compute uh, the Yang Mills amplitudes, and one can do that, in fact, uh, much more efficiently than with traditional techniques, then uh, you can get the gravitational amplitudes uh, as well. And um, when we when we pick up after the break, we'll see how to go from uh, amplitudes 
to things that are a little bit closer to observables. So let us pause here and I'll let uh, 